This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T, and you are listening to episode 101. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rkraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Jeff Gannon, co-founder and portfolio manager at Focused Compounding. You might also recognize Jeff from the very popular investing podcast, Focused Compounding, which he co-hosts with his partner, Andrew Kuhn. I'm a big fan of their work, and I invited on Jeff to share his background and to chat about his investing philosophy. We recorded this interview back in September, so keep that in mind when you hear us discuss the news about Willow Oak Asset Management and Focus Compounding to jointly launch a new private investment fund. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 101 of the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my interview with Jeff Gannon. I'd like to thank you all again for listening and wish you all a very happy, happy Thanksgiving and happy holidays. So now a word from our sponsor. To my loyal listeners, subscribers, and fans, Robert Kraft here, your host on the Planet Microcap podcast. The 2020 Investor Conference season is upon us. Where are you going this year? I'd like to take a second to invite you to join me, maybe a few of the guests you've heard on this podcast, to our annual Microcap Investor Conference, the Planet Microcap Showcase, April 21st through 23rd, 2020 at Bally's Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. The Planet Microcap Showcase will be two and a half days of company presentations, networking opportunities, an educational workshop, and you will get to meet privately in one-on-one meetings with management of well-known emerging growth private and publicly traded microcap companies. We are back with new surprises and programming that you will not want to miss. So join us for the Planet Microcap Showcase, April 21 through 23, 2020 at Bally's Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. For more information and register to attend, please visit www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vegas. This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host on the Planet Microcap Podcast. And with me today is Jeff Gannon, who is the co-founder and portfolio manager at Focused Compounding Capital Management. Jeff, welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. Great. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. So, uh, as we always do here, you know, I want to get started with your background. You know, how would you get your start and your interest in finance and investing? Uh, well, I got interested in investing when I was a teenager. I probably bought my first stock when I was like fourteen or something like that. Um, my dad actually had read a magazine article that mentioned Benjamin Graham, uh, Warren Buffett's teacher, and. Um, I was starting to pick stocks for myself around that time. I was probably, uh, like I said, probably 14. And uh, it's just he thought that what I did sounded a lot like what he read about in this um, magazine article reviewing a book about Ben Graham. And so uh, based on that, I started reading about Ben Graham. And that got me interested in value investing. And from there, um, you know, a few years later, I started a, a blog when I guess I was – I don't know, 18 or 19, something like that, and a podcast, and it went from there. All right, so this is very interesting, Jeff. You know, most people, they read Ben Graham, you know, intelligent investor, Warren Buffett, and then they say, oh, okay, I want to be that type of investor. So you were a born value investor, if, if I may. Yes, that's that's <laughs> absolutely true. <laughs> So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I just started out not knowing how to invest. Uh, I didn't, you know, uh, it was actually the late 1990s. Mm-hmm. So what people were saying didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so as a teenager listening to what people were saying about, um, you know, the new IPOs and things like that didn't make a lot of sense, but I was finding 
things that did make sense. And it kind of turned out more like the way Ben Graham thought about things, uh, valuing an entire company, uh, valuing it, uh, a stock at, by looking at the entire company, what's it's, what it's worth and looking mm-hmm. at the financial statements and those sorts of things instead of um, more of what people were doing in the late 90s with a lot of the new uh, issues and things like that. So really intuitively or did you, I mean, because this is pretty fascinating to me in the sense that you were just listening to what's going on and you knew just inherently that it, it didn't make sense or, right. did you, or, or did you look at, were you looking at financial statements even prior and say, oh, these are good companies. Why are they talking about all these hot IPOs that make no money. I mean, what what was it? Yeah, it was sort of uh, uh, that what people were saying didn't make sense, and then I had to find a, something that did make sense. I see. So um, yeah, so you know, it, it was things like people who hadn't you know been involved in stocks um, before, relatives, friends, whoever you know at, at that time, were suddenly interested in all these different stocks, and then you would go look them up and. Um, I mean, in some cases, it would be things where they're trading at 100 times earnings or something, you know, and just not knowing anything about investing. You think about it and you say, okay, well, how fast would it have to grow to pay me back? You know, when you sort of think about what a stock is and you don't have that experience of uh, knowing that some things get bid up to these huge prices and that people are really excited about them, you just think of it sort of like a business, which I would be as a teenager. I didn't know other than a stock is a part ownership in a business. Um, It just didn't make sense to me. And so then I looked for things that did make sense. And um, actually, the first stock that I uh, bought, I believe, was uh, a company I worked for, sort of. I, I was a bagger at a grocery store uh, when I was 14. That was when I was 14. And um, that was Village Supermarket. And I bought that. Uh, and that's just an operator of ShopRites. So ShopRite is a brand of a supermarket, pretty big one, the, probably the biggest in the state of New Jersey. And uh, I worked at the store and saw how incredibly popular the store was and what it sold and everything. And I looked at the stock and uh, it was incredibly cheap. <laughs> it was like five or six times earnings, uh, big discount to book value, things like that. And um, uh, that was probably because it was like the late 90s and, and the early 2000s, the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, something like a grocery store, people are already talking about uh, online groceries, even though this was 20 years ago. They're already worrying about things like, uh, well, all groceries will be sold online and stuff. And, and so it wasn't a popular stock. Gotcha. And, and just for full disclosure, are you still currently a shareholder of Shopping? No, no. I own that for, uh, personally, I own that for, I don't know, five or 10 years or something, but I haven't owned it in over 10 years. Gotcha. Okay. So, so taking your gen- your genesis here, so we stopped at 1819 where you were, you started your blog, you started this podcast. You must have been one of the first podcasters in the business doing yeah, this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I, I just, um, you know, look, I, I, I know math, but I'm not that quick, but you know, just doing a quick calculation there. Um, <laughs> but you know, so, so I have to ask, you know, what, have you just been doing that since then? Or, you know, have you gone to a couple firms, start a couple firms, you know, wh- how have you ended up to where you're at today? Yeah, so I started a uh, so that was 2005. I guess I started the podcast. Certainly, I started the blog in 2005 mm-hmm. and 2006. I wrote a newsletter for a while then, and then there started to be around that time some uh, websites that would buy articles from people uh, that were sort of value investing related and stuff like that. I don't remember the exact year that started to get bigger, but uh, Guru Focus is a good example of that. And that's mm-hmm. one of the places that I sold articles to, in addition to blogging. And so I would sell articles on like a freelance basis. But what started to happen is I wrote more and more articles uh, specifically for Guru Focus so that I was – at times it was like every day they were publishing an article of mine. And so a few years after that, they uh, – the owner of Guru Focus asked if I would become a full-time employee mm-hmm. and um, move to their headquarters, which is Plano. I was in New Jersey. And so that's how I ended up out in Texas. Um and I moved there for that job, worked there for very briefly, only a few months. And um, But while doing what I was doing there at Guru Focus, planning for certain things that they were going to do, um, I met someone uh, who I started to work on stuff about with stocks and things. And eventually what we did is we started our own newsletter. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he's from Vietnam and is no longer in the business. He's now actually uh, getting a PhD in uh, artificial intelligence. But at wow. the time, <laughs> at the time he was uh, he was a um, college student in um, I think his major might have been applied math, uh, or it might have been math theory or th- something like that. But he was, um, but he had become interested in finance and more practical things, uh, and so he was really looking for. His, uh, he had read some of the articles that I wrote and stuff and, uh, he just was very good at that sort of thing, even though he didn't have a background in it. And, uh, so we started up a newsletter and did that for th- three years or so we published for, 
and it probably took longer. We there was a little bit of a startup period and a little bit afterwards, so three or four years of that, and then almost right after he left uh, to to pursue a PhD and stuff, um, I met Andrew, who's the co-founder of Focus Compounding, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's when we started a website, Focus Compounding, and then like a year or so later after that, we started. Uh, actually managing accounts and things like that. But we started out as just a uh, member website where we uh, did things that I wrote and and other stuff like that for research and sort of, um, you know, just a place for value investors to learn about specific stocks and things like that. Gotcha. So so really focus compounding is kind of a, a mixture of, you know, some capital management, which is mm-hmm. you know, your portfolio management manager there. And then also a lot of content around it for um, um, right. education, marketing, that kind of deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it has a lot. I mean, the biggest part of that site is probably um, there's a section that just says stocks A to Z. It's laid out a lot like uh, Value Investors Club. Mm-hmm. And um, it has a lot of things that I mean, the, the most by any one author by me, but we also have things from other people, members who put up ideas and things like that. Um, and so it's just a, a way to share a lot of those ideas. And like I said, it is very value investing uh, focused. It's a, you know, it's a membership thing. You pay for a monthly membership. Gotcha. So that, that's actually a perfect segue into, uh, you know, uh, really getting into the investment strategy part of this podcast, you know, so I want to dive in here. What, what would you say is your investing thesis? And, and really, in other words, you know, what, what are those four initial checklist items you use before researching a stock? Okay, so, uh, in terms of the stocks that we consider for the accounts I manage, they have to be an overlooked stock. So, and then we have a specific definition of what an overlooked stock is, although really it's just a subjective sort of thing that it has to be overlooked. So what I mean by that is no matter how attractive I might find Apple at a certain price or something, we won't buy it. Um, not because it's not a good stock, but it's just not what we do. Uh, we think we'll do better over time um, focusing on the stuff that other people aren't. So for us, an overlooked stock means usually there's sort of two signs of an overlooked stock. And when we find both of them together, we know it's overlooked. Mm -hmm. The first sign is that it has to have a low um, share turnover percentage in the sense of the actual amount of uh, shares traded in a given year, let's say, is low compared to the shares outstanding. So uh, basically, it doesn't turn over its shares much. We're willing to buy pretty big stocks. If they uh, if they actually trade infrequently, so it's not a market cap issue for us. Now, what tends to happen though is big stocks are in indexes and things, so they they do turn over a lot anyway. But there are some that that don't. And then the other one connected to that we've noticed is low beta. Mm-hmm. So a low beta is often not just associated with like a lower risk stock or a lower volatility stock or a more defensive stock or whatever like people might think. It also tends to be associated with a stock that isn't of much interest to traders. Because if traders had a lot of interest in the stock, it would tend to get closer to a beta of one. Mm -hmm. So to have both of those things together really indicates that it's not something that's followed a lot by by traders. And um, and so the the length of holding time tends to be longer for the people who are in it. There tends to be more ownership by founders, but also big shareholders, things like that. Uh, And so all those things go together with it's usually a smaller stock. Um, It definitely has very little analyst coverage. It's certainly not an index. A lot of times it's an OTC stock, and in some cases it's a stock that doesn't file with the SEC. The main follow-up to to what you're saying there then is, you know, once you, they've kind of, you've identified a few of these stocks that have come through your screens. I mean, what's some of your next steps then then there to then potentially go and invest in them? Okay, so um, we tend not to focus too much on exactly what the value is right away. But we are value investors. So, I mean, I was talking to someone recently and said, you know, it's rare that I'm going to pay more than like 13 times earnings or something. So I'm definitely a value investor. But we're open to looking at first. Um, so we we might prefer a stock at 13 times earnings to six times earnings if it's a better business. But we're not paying 30 times earnings for anything. So there are some things we can rule out right away because we're definitely value investors. Mm-hmm. But the, uh, the, the more likely one is that we do have a focus on um, – I. Uh, some people, I guess, in terms of factors and things, people would call it quality. But really what we're talking about is uh, l- l- we look for less competitive businesses, businesses that don't face a lot of competition, businesses with higher retention rates of their customers, things like that. So they tend to have more stable margins. Um, they're almost always free cash flow generative. Um, 
They, so, yeah, they do tend to have high returns on equity and stuff like that that would show up statistically. But really, they're, they're, I guess it's like what Buffett would talk about with a durable competitive advantage. We're looking for something that um, suggests that competitors can't come in and ruin their business quickly, at least. Um, there's some way in which they have, I guess you would call it a moat or something. He would call it a moat. Um, but it's uh, they have some sort of protection from – uh, the amount of competition that we see in most businesses. So it, we tend to avoid sort of the more commodity type businesses, uh, businesses that are just about having the lowest price. And we definitely avoid lots of uh, businesses with a lot of change. Uh, almost everything we own has pretty low amounts of change in it. Um, uh, we're very um, worried about sort of th things that um, – I guess that the, the kind of things that growth investors would speculate on. Like I said, we're value investors, and that's probably the biggest difference um, with us is the price we pay and also the kinds of businesses we buy. So it's usually business that doesn't change a lot and has some sort of uh, advantage um, or some sort of uh, uh, some sort of lower than normal competitive situation. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So I mean, let, let's dig into this durable competitive advantage aspect here because I feel like that. It, while it's something that you would think could be objective from person to person, investor to investor, it's very subjective as what you perceive to be a durable competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. So for you and your firm, you know, how do you assess what is uh, a business that has that durable competitive advantage? Okay, so um, I'll give an example, which is one that we own. As of now, it's the biggest position we have. Mm -hmm. And that's NACO which stands for North American Coal Company. Mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, coal is not an advantaged industry. But uh, the company, um, its coal operations are all coal mines that are sited at the customer's plant. Um, so they aren't shipping by rail or something like that. They're uh, a combination of a power plant, usually it's a power plant, and um, a lignite coal mine right there. And the company operates the Mine on behalf of the customer. The customer puts up the capital. Uh, when they do this, they usually sign a long-term contract. And even were the contract to expire, the power plant realistically doesn't have a cheaper source of coal than the coal that's right there. So the risk that you have is the power pl plant might shut down, but not a competitive risk in that they're going to source their coal from someone else. Uh, so like I think NACO's uh, contracts right now, the next ones expire in 12 years, and the longest dated one expires in like 27 years from now, something like that. So it's common for them to be 15 or 30 year contracts. Um, and they're basically, uh, they have, well, they have no exposure to coal prices. They just have a cost um, per uh, amount of energy that they're providing, basically, or per ton of coal. They're pretty similar either way. And um, it's sort of a cost plus on top of that is a way of thinking about it. So it adjusts with the index and things like that. So for the power plant, it's um, a way of sourcing coal every year at basically the same price or a price that moves with inflation. Uh, as opposed to most coal mines in the country producing thermal coal are going to be shipping by rail, uh, higher grade coal, and they're going to be exposed to commodity price fluctuations. So this way, at least, uh, the company doesn't face competition in the sense that if a coal mine opens in another part of the country, it affects them. Uh, there are still huge risks because coal power plants could shut down. Uh, but there's less risk of competition, as you see there. So that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. Got it. So then, I, you know, I also have to ask because, you know, we're a microcap investing podcast. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, guests I've had on talk about where they they tend when they do their screens that – Based on their thesis, they tend to find these small cap, smaller companies tend to be kind of in their wheelhouse, similar to what you're saying today, you know. And we always talk about management. So where right. would you, where would you say management uh, falls in the lexicon of a focus for you guys at your firm and, and for you? So uh, that's a really good question. Um, I so one thing, unlike a lot of investors, I avoid speaking to management directly. Now, I'm interested in what management uh, – I'm interested in forming an opinion about management mostly based on their past behavior, to some extent based on what they say, and to some extent based on what other people tell me uh, are their perceptions of management. However, uh, I, I don't like to talk to – I, I mean not only do I not like to talk to them, I basically – insist that I don't talk to them uh, because I, I'm worried about forming certain uh, opinions about if they're good salespeople, that really doesn't make a difference in terms of uh, the kinds of things that I'm looking for. So the kinds of things that I'm looking for is really um, 
that they have to be honest, obviously. Uh, in many cases, especially with the smaller companies we have, although they're audited by a um, company that does audits of public companies, uh, they're small auditors and I don't have much faith in the audit. Um, to be honest, you can look at the PCAOB um, website to get information on those auditors, uh, but they often are auditing, auditing very few companies. They have very few employees. I, they're usually not very close to the company that they're auditing, so they're not paying a lot for the audit. Um, so you really, I, I have much more faith in uh, in um, financial statements based on whether I have faith in management or not, rather than whether it's been audited correctly or not. Uh, with big companies, you would probably have a lot more faith in the audit. Sure. Um, so there's the ownership amounts that they have with it. Um, the biggest thing for me is usually capital allocation and strategy. So like, will they issue shares or not? Um, do they think in sort of per share terms, uh, things like that? There are some risks in closely controlled companies and we tend to own companies where the shareholders, uh, where um, families or some sort of insider owns a very large portion. Like I mentioned, NACO, uh, that's one where there's two classes of stock and descendants of the, basically the founder uh, own over half of the voting shares. So they're not going to sell the company. Uh, they're going to do things that minimize taxes for them and stuff. And they're upfront about that fact. Um, so you just have to be aware of that. Uh, usually our biggest risk is um, different from investors in big companies. Investors in big companies usually have risks related to the fact that the uh, CEO and stuff is sort of professional management and might not have a very big stake in the company. Mm -hmm. For us, it's almost always the reverse. They have a very big stake in the company. And sometimes uh, they may have an interest in like taking the company private or something at a price that's not very attractive to us. Um, that's usually the biggest risk is that they, that they will um, try to take advantage of a low stock price or something like that to pay – uh, a decent premium to the market price, but something that's maybe not fair or something to take out uh, minority shareholders. That's the most likely one because most of the management teams we're looking at are very, very big owners of the stock. Got it. So then how do you put together what your thesis on management will be? Because, you know, as you said, you know, a lot of investors and private investors, institutions, they love, you know, they go to conferences, they go, they listen to the conference calls. Uh, some even do site visits. So, right. uh, you know, it seems like that's uh, how do you mitigate that risk of having a poor assessment of that management team without just seeing them face to face, getting that eye to eye and really understanding, you know, what that person's all about? Yeah, the the most common thing uh, in terms of how I assess management is by looking at the very long term record. So you're absolutely right that it's really hard to um, come to a judgment about management if they are fairly new. So I would have to do those things. Basically, you would have to uh, meet them. You have to do site visits and things if this was management that came in six months ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, if this is management that's been there for a decade or more, uh, then you can look a lot of their actions and also what they said in the past and then how that turned out, you know. Um, so that is true. We tend to be somewhat disadvantaged, I guess, that way in that uh, we probably would avoid stocks that have a, a major changes to management recently. And we probably are less likely to buy into stocks that have um, uh, that have less involvement by the people who founded and stuff like that. I mean, um, we're talking about a huge amount of management continuity in the stocks that we're investing. Usually, um, while they're not all big owners, they're all really pretty closely connected to the first or second generation of the company. Usually, um, they've been there for a very long time. Uh, you know, and so we can see that they were involved in making the past capital allocation decisions and things like that. Uh, in terms of the, the things I look at, I look at just the longest term record I can find. I always read the oldest possible annual report that I can find on a company. Um, although I don't talk to management, I do request that they send any financials they have historically that they still have on hand and stuff from a long time ago. And sometimes they'll do that. I was, uh, researching a company recently where I asked that and they actually sent me 50, uh, 50 year summary oh, of their nice. past record. Oh, that, yeah. that must have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's very helpful. You know, when you have mm -hmm. something like that, you don't need to know a lot about what they s claim they're going to do because you can see that that same family, what they really did over the last 50 years. And I kind of put more faith in what they actually did over the last 50 years than what they say they're going to do in the next five or something like that. Gotcha. So what are some of the, you know, uh, staying on this path because uh, we've talked about capital allocation on the podcast before and I love hearing everybody's interpretation and what they look for. So for you, what are some key indicators for good capital allocation? 
So the number one most important thing of all, we're usually investing in good businesses. It almost never makes sense for a good business to issue stock. Almost never. Um, I mean, for a great business, it never makes sense. So, uh, you know, uh, if you have a great business, a, a real something with a moat and stuff like that, uh, a lot of uh, CEOs will be tempted to issue stock to do acquisitions, um, which might be smart acquisitions if they were done with cash, but turn out to be dumb acquisitions if they're done with stock. So we really, really look for things that have flat or declining share counts. Uh, we have been involved in very few stocks that have increasing share counts over time, which is a big difference from a lot of microcap stuff because obviously they, that that's a reason why they're public. They need to have increasing share counts to have access to capital. You know, they don't have the same access to uh, issue bonds or usually the same sort of advantageous uh, bank loans and things like that. So they would need to issue more stock. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the biggest one. Uh, in terms of some of the other things uh, – definitely that it's run in a way that it should survive no matter what. Mm -hmm. Um, Compared to most investors, I'm probably more comfortable with a company that holds a fair amount of cash and doesn't take on a lot of debt uh, than I'd say many investors are. Because many investors, when they say capital allocation or they say that the the balance sheet isn't optimized and things like that, they mean they'd like it to uh, look a little bit more like private equity to make it look. They'd like it to at least borrow a few times EBITDA. They'd like to do a big uh, stock buyback with that borrowing, things like that. Um, I don't necessarily need that, uh, especially in companies that are more cyclical or something like that. I think it's fine to hold a fair amount of cash and things like that. Mostly it's the opposite. It's uh, it's looking at negative sorts of things of what they don't do. So what I need them not to do is not to make acquisitions that are far uh, different from what their business they're already in. I need them to not issue stock, um, things like that. I need to avoid the really dumb mistakes. Um, more so than than doing really smart things. Uh, even when we own stocks that do buybacks, usually they're not huge buybacks that were done at really good prices. They're more like they buy a little bit back every year. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, I mean, if I was, you know, making the decisions on the board about that, that's not how I would pick it as a value investor. I would, you know, focus more on buying back more stock when the stock is cheaper and less when it's more expensive. But I understand that, you know, people who run companies are not uh, value investors, they're people who are successful at running a company. And that's a pretty good way of allocating capital. That's enough. I can't really expect more than that from someone who's an expert on running a business and not an expert on investing. You know, that's an interesting point. You know, uh, you so, so is that something that you also actively look for? I mean, uh, managers that really are running the business like they're running a business versus you know, you know, they might have some kind of value investing or just investing background in general. You know, is it that they're really focused more on just, okay, let's, let's run the business as a business as opposed to, okay, I got to think about my stock price while I'm running this business. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, it, usually it's people who are, who I think are good at running their business and usually the best ones, I think their attitude is the stock will probably be right over time, but it could be wrong a lot in, in the moment and we don't pay much attention to it that way, but over the long run, it'll tend to work out. Um, you know, uh, we do, so we did, uh, in the last uh, month or so, we sold a position in computer services, Mm -hmm. uh, which is usually called CS, the, the, uh, company usually just goes by CSI. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is one which is interesting because it's a, uh, OTC stock, Um, it is not, uh, it does not file with the SEC. However, for a not a stock that isn't listed, it does have a surprising amount of, um, sort of concern about its stock price. Like it did a stock split, um, which, you know, some OTC stocks do and stuff, but, uh, it puts out press releases that talk a little bit about it. I had read some reviews by employees saying that the company is management is very aware of the stock and, um, that, and employees saying the stock's a good investment, you should own it over time and stuff like that, uh, too. But, um, that's just unusual to see in a company that's so low profile that way, you know, that's not a listed stock. Um, but that's a stock that's been public for 50, uh, years or something. And it is, I think it's increased its dividend like every year during that time period, probably close to it. So, um, the people, so I bet a lot of employees and stuff do own the stock and that may be why the company has that kind of, uh, concern about the stock uh, price. But a- anyway, it's just unusual that they put out uh, the comp- kind of company I invest in puts out a press release that says, oh, we're returning uh, to shareholders by increasing our dividend, by splitting the stock, by doing things like that, you know, um, which is more common among uh, that's the kind of thing that big uh, companies and indexes and stuff would talk about all the time, shareholder value and all that right. stuff. 
Um, and it tends not to be what the kind of companies we invest in do. But but that one did, and that they sort of had a bit of an investor relations department, I think. They had a nice website for that. I mean, I don't know why they put all that effort into it when they uh, just don't list on a, on a major exchange or anything. But uh, but most of our companies aren't like that. They're They're much quieter than that. So not to take a hard turn or anything, but I, I also have to ask because, you know, uh, uh, is co- concentration versus diversification, you know, for you guys, what, what's, where do you fall in line with this? You know, do you guys tend to be more concentrated or do you have a more diversified uh, outlook? Uh, I would say we tend to be extremely concentrated because whenever we tell people we're concentrated and they say, oh yeah, we're a concentrated investor too or whatever. And then we tell them how many we own. Uh, they're like, oh, that's concentrated. So I like to own five stocks. I try to own five stocks equally weighted as much as possible when I buy them. Uh, that doesn't actually happen because, uh, you know, the price runs up a little. I don't get the shares I want or whatever. But a normal position for me is 20%. When I decide I want to buy a stock, I try to put about 20% of the uh, portfolio into it. Mm-hmm. Is a- any, reason, any reasoning behind that or is that just one of those like, you know what, I like five, 20%, <laughs> I'm good. Uh, if I was just investing my own money, it would be three probably. <laughs> it, I mean, in gotcha. my own money, it had been three. Uh, so it's five because, uh, I feel like that's the lowest number that, uh, <laughs> clients can say, okay, that that's more than three. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, so, I mean, there's, there statistically there's stuff that I don't think it makes a huge. So, I mean, probably if you were trying to optimize the portfolio in terms of the amount of volatility and, and, and the, the diversification that you had in terms of the individual company risk, you could make a case that like 20 up to 25 stocks or something makes sense. Right. Um, and that you shouldn't do less than like say five or something like that. Uh, and then it's probably mostly a matter of taste in between those numbers, but that's more for a value investor who's picking more in terms of, um, financial, uh, statements and uh, just the pure metrics of it. So like if I was just buying a portfolio of low price to book stocks or something, it would be like 25 stocks. It wouldn't be five. Mm-hmm. But that's not what I'm doing. It's it's really focusing on um, – what, what I found is that if I try to own 10 stocks, let's say instead of five or 15 instead of five, uh, those were always the portfolios I liked least. Because I had to keep lowering my standards in terms of the the things we talked about with like lack of competition and stuff like that. So I became uh, – I just was exposing the portfolio more and more to the just basic risks of capitalism, which is what, what most um, portfolios face, which is you know other companies coming in and taking market for share from you and things like that. I can often find five companies that I think are very well positioned in their industries and very well protected from competition. Um, I can't find a lot more than that at the prices I want to pay. Now, of course, I could if I didn't have requirements about the price I want to pay, um, you know, uh, have a 20-some stock portfolio. I mean, I mentioned that we sold computer services in the last month or whatever. Uh, The stock got to like 26 or 27 times earnings. Um, You know, I don't remember exactly, you know, when we bought it, it was in a teens P and for me, that was really expensive. Uh, you know, I, I sold it cause I wanted to buy something else, but even then, if I don't want to buy something else, I don't really want to own stocks that are trading at over 30 times earnings or something. So it was getting to a point where as much as I liked the business and you know, it's, it was, uh, it's a core processor for banks. It has probably 90 some percent retention rates or something. The contracts usually run, I think their average contract that they've re-signed recently is like eight years or something. And the main reason why banks leave them is they get acquired by another bank. Um, they rarely have someone uh, leave them to switch to another core processor. And that's not because they're a great core processor. It's just because banks almost never switch core processors. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can find like one of those stocks. But like as an example, uh, as far as I know, computer services is the only overlooked stock that's a core processor because the others are like Jack Henry and a few other even bigger um, uh, stocks that are all in indexes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I love that industry, but I could only find one stock in it that was cheap enough. Um, cause like I said, I mean, we're not going to buy something at 20 or more times earnings. It's just not going to happen. So to find sort of a company that I think has a moat and a pretty good price, I rarely find more than five of those at once. You know, at what point in, in your career did you have to tell yourself, look, I need to just focus in on what I know best and what I know works for me best because, you know, at, at the, at the highly concentrated portfolio I'm, and, and running capital management firm, I'm sure you get pressure from everyone saying, you know, why don't you own more? Why, you know, why so, why so few, you know, you feel like you really have to be like, you know, stand pat with, you know, this is my beliefs. This is what works. You know, we're going with this, you know, at what point did you have to make that conscious choice in your career? Well, um, 
I, I only made, had to make that choice with people and when we started Focus Compounding. And there's a reason why we named it Focus Compounding and stuff like that because we knew exactly what we were looking at. And we used the word focus all the time when talking to people to try to reinforce that idea for them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the way that it shaped that idea for me really is uh, in bad markets. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've only experienced two that were bad uh, in, in, when I had just first started investing uh, in the early 2000s was a bad market. Now, it was great for me and for value investors generally, but for the general public, it was terrible. And then in 2008, that was terrible for everyone, including for me and for value investors. And um, if you own a bigger portfolio, um, like in 2008, so for instance, in 2008, I would have owned more stocks than I do now. Uh, and it's more of a value type portfolio just in the sense that the stocks are cheap. Uh, you do worry more about um, what's in your portfolio when you go to sleep at night and stuff like that. And it's just much easier with the kind of portfolio that I have. And um, I would say if it wasn't for those bad times, it would be very easy to um, – not be so concentrated and not to be so focused on what I think I can do best and to have a more conventional approach. The reason for being less conventional and sticking to it no matter what is because of memories of those times and what it was like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the uh, for instance, I, I um, ha I've been investing in something. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was uh, in 2008. I was actually investing in something which was a liquidation. Uh, which, you know, I'd invest in things like that before. They're just a special situation that you make some money on. It almost always works out once it's announced. It's just a question of how long it takes. There's mm -hmm. some risk to it, but it's, it's sort of like merger arbitrage kind of calculation you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and they tend to have pretty good returns, but uh, they had already announced liquidation stuff and it actually the company failed because mm -hmm. they didn't get bank, bank fa financing for it. A bank wouldn't finance them to liquidate at a price that was well below um, what the inventory would have been worth if it had an orderly liquidation stuff. But because it happened in the last few months of 2008, there was no opportunity to do a an orderly liquidation. Banks weren't interested, even in lending against good collateral and stuff like that at the time. And so even things that made sense like that could go wrong um, in a period like that. And so being invested in things that have uh, constantly have good free cash flow, have what you think is a wider moat, don't have debt that they need refinancing and stuff, the kinds of things that we try to focus on, um, you just feel better uh, for those times that are tough. And it's hard to keep doing that, though, because now it's been like, you know, whatever, 10 years or something of uh, less stressful times. But you just remember those times, and that's why you keep insisting on it. And you have to keep telling people, well, yes, this we, we would have had just as good results if we owned more stocks um, in the good times, you know, in the last 10 years or so. But, you know, you'll see. Uh, eventually there are years that aren't like that and that's when it pays off to focus on the things that we know best for sure and, and speaking of what you might know best you know in in doing my research for our interview today you know i noticed that on on your podcast and also on the website you you tend to discuss investing in, in bank stocks a lot you, mm -hmm. i don't want to say a lot that's you know but but there's you have you have a couple articles and and a couple videos on it you know, I actually had a, a we did an a, a, an episode on here with I don't know if you know Nate Tobik from Oddball Stocks. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. we love Nate, and uh, he he also focused a lot on bank stocks. You know, so so for you, uh, you know, how do you then analyze bank stocks, and, and why do you really look at this sector? Yeah, so uh, so it's good that you bring up Nate because our approaches are probably the opposite. I would guess for the most part, he wrote an excellent book, uh, Bank Investor's Handbook, and. Um, I would say he tends to focus more like many value investors do on like a low price to book and things like that. Now he also incorporates other things into it. I think that's very smart. But uh, I tend to look for the banks that I like best in terms of their business models. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually have not invested uh, really in like community banks and banks trading at uh, deep price to book discounts and things like that. So um, – for uh, Focus Compounding, there's five reports that I did up there, and uh, they're on um, – let's see. I'll just go through what they are first. Uh, so they're Frost, Bank of Hawaii, Prosperity Bank, uh, BOK Financial, which is Bank of Oklahoma, and um, Commerce Bank Shares, which is the one in St. Louis. There's a bunch of banks called Commerce. And, um, and, and I – yeah. I was going to say, and real quick, are you, uh, for full disclosure, are you uh, currently were uh, or ever owned any shares in those yes. companies? Yes. I personally, uh, and accounts I manage, owned Frost, but do not own it now. Mm 
Got it. Yeah. Um, and Frost is the biggest uh, bank headquarter in Texas. Uh, Prosperity would be the second biggest. Um, and uh, so those aren't cheap banks uh, compared to the sorts of things that value investors generally buy. But I like them for their deposit bases. So the way that I analyze a bank is I look at the liability side, the deposits, not really the assets so much. Um, and I just focus on who has the lowest costs uh, all in of deposits, costs in terms of what they pay in interest and also uh, non-interest uh, expense uh, with uh, offset to the extent it's offset by non-interest income. And that's your cost of funding, basically. Uh, it's like if you had – we're looking at insurer and insurer would say their combined ratio is 102. That means you have a 2% cost of um, funding. Uh, you know, With a bank, if they're, um, if they're paying 1% on deposits and their net non-interest expense is $1 uh, for every $100 they have in deposits, then that's a 2% cost of funding. And so if they go out and buy things that yield 5% or something, then they're making you know 3% on that. Uh, a lot of people focus on the net interest margin, which only includes the interest aspects of that. But the real way that banks are successful in the U.S. usually is by having very low non-interest expense. And so, example, using Frost, that's why they have a low um, cost of funding is that they average about $200 million in deposits per branch. And I would guess the average – Bank branch in the U.S. probably has 50 million in deposits. So by having four times as much in deposits per branch, then things like rent are just cheaper uh, versus the amount of deposits they have. And that sounds like a little thing, but actually um, rent is a significant part of what banks are really paying for uh, in terms of what they need to get a return on their deposits. Um, so it doesn't show up in net interest margin and stuff, but things like that. Uh, so scale is important in banking, but scale at the customer level, at the branch level, and then also at the overall bank level too. So, um, and that's kind of the Warren Buffett way of looking at it. Like all the banks he invests in tend to be higher price to book banks, but have very, very low cost of funding. Um, Wells Fargo is a good example. Wells Fargo and Frost tend to have very similar cost of funding, although Wells grows more uh, over time, maybe not now, uh, and definitely is more uh, is a better lender and more aggressive lender and stuff than Frost. So it has better returns, but they probably both have the same cost of funding. Gotcha. So not to make, take another hard turn here, but I, I wanted to get into uh, something that you and Andrew also discuss a lot on the on your podcast. And uh, you you do a lot of topics on uh, on these books and also topics from the books themselves. And these are you know very well known various uh, uh, investing books. So my question now is a two parter. What would you say is your favorite investing book? And then what is your favorite investing book for new investors and why? Well, my favorite investing book is "You Can Be a Stock Market Genius" by Joel Greenblatt. Uh, in my favorite for a new investor um, would probably be – I would guess it would be Peter Lynch beating the street mm -hmm. probably or one up on Wall Street. It, they're either one. Uh, but yeah, my, my own personal favorite is you can be a songwriter genius, which uh, I don't know if that one would be appropriate for a beginner. Um it's pretty simple in the way it's laid out and stuff. It's pretty complicated in the sorts of things that it's focused on. Um, but it's actually a very easy read. And so I think that someone could read it who was a beginner. There's nothing – you don't need a background in finance or anything to read it. But um, it does focus on like spinoffs and, and uh, leaps and merger arbitrage and all sorts of other things. So um, that's not usually where beginners start. Mm. Well, what would you say when you were starting out and you were reading some of these books? I mean, what what would you say was the key thing you focused on when you were reading some of these books that you've, I'd say, even carried to today? Yeah, well, some of my favorite books are the Ben Graham books. Mm -hmm. So like I said, uh, I learned about that when I was a teenager. So as soon as my dad showed me that magazine article, I went out and I bought um, Security Analysis and the intelligent investor and i read both of them the same weekend and i love them and that really uh increased my interest in investing i mean from that point on i've just been uh, obsessed with investing so uh, andrew does not like either of those books and many people don't like them uh they find them very dry uh the original version of security analysis i have is from the 1930s and um the version of the intelligent investor i was reading was probably from the 1970s but much of it is based on something that was late 40s so um but those 
basic ideas that Ben Graham had are the things I think are most important. Um, we did podcasts recently on two chapters from that book, the Intelligent Investor Chapter 8 and Chapter 20, and those are the two most important. He does um, – Chapter 8 is Mr. Market, where he talks about um, the way you have to think about the market is that um, you have a partner in business with you and you own this private business together 50-50 or whatever. And on some days – Mr. Market comes to you and he says, um, you know, uh, that he, he offers to buy you out um, or to sell to you at the same price. And sometimes that price is very low because he's very depressed about things and the prospects <laughs> for your business. And sometimes that price is very high because, you know, he's seen something on the way to work that's made him excited about the prospects for your business in the future. And the important thing is to take advantage of that instead of thinking that uh, the price that Mr. Market is offering you is giving you information about your business. Instead, you have to take advantage of him. So that's a really important chapter. And that's the most important thing in investing um, to me, except for chapter 20, which is the absolute number one most important, which is margin of safety. Mm -hmm. And so Graham applies the ideas that he had um, learned that were common for people to know about on Wall Street for analysts to think in terms of for bonds, which is to have certain interest coverage ratios and things like that in bonds, and to apply that same idea to stocks. So instead of uh, speculating in stocks, instead of just looking at the upside, you looked at what could go wrong and you could still make money. And that's how Graham thought. And I think that's very important um, to, you know, if you focus on being completely right about the um, downside protection that you have in a stock, um, you don't have to worry so much about the upside that you'll get. Um, often you'll find that it naturally uh, comes and, and that uh, as long as you have a very good record in terms of the protection that you have for things going wrong, that you'll find that there are some positive surprises. And a lot of people focus a lot on um, how much they stand to gain without thinking a lot about how little has to go wrong for them to lose money on stock. So those two chapters to me are the most important. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you made a book that was just those two chapters, I think anyone could read that and enjoy it. I don't know. I think a lot of people find it dry generally in the Intelligent Investment Security Analysis. You know, we should just have Richard Attenborough just do uh, a, an audio book for it. I think then we might have a lot more value investors out there. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 what would, so, Jeff, what would you say then is like the the biggest annoyance you have in your process? You know, what what are some of the things out there when you're looking at companies or you're in the process of doing your research that you're just like, ah, I just wish it was either simpler or better. I don't know. Like, what what are some things out there that you wish that could help you? when you're looking for potential new investments or just in investing in general? Well, I do look at a lot of OTC stocks. Mm -hmm. So the advantage and the disadvantage of it is the advantage is that I'm trying to look for things that other people aren't looking for. Mm -hmm. But the disadvantage of that is I'm looking through 19 stocks that I can instantly tell are not seriously uh, worthy of investment stuff. There might be speculative. There might be things that might work out for them in the future. But these are not really – uh, companies that you'd ever consider for investment that anyone would uh, to find one stock that's kind of interesting, you know. Um, so I just going through the pink sheets and things like that. Uh, that I do sometimes go through company after company after company that isn't that interesting. Um, just in the sense that uh, it's lost money in the past. It doesn't have a real um, business model uh, that's going to work. It's somewhat promotional, um, things like that. Uh, and that's different from what most people are experiencing because most people investing in um, – I mean, you don't see that in S&P 500 companies. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be overpriced. They may have lots of things wrong with them, but they were once good businesses at least. They might be in decline now, but you don't get to be one of the biggest companies in the world without having a good business at one time, a legitimate business. But on the pink sheets, you do find there's probably thousands of companies that are um, not worth uh, even reading about. Uh, but I do read about them, and sometimes occasionally I find things that are interesting. I've, I mean, the reason why I do that is because I've even found companies I think have a durable competitive advantage in, in some things that are literally penny stocks. Um, it's very rare. But I found something that, uh, you know, traded at uh, well under a dollar and yet had those things. And there's, you, there's a reason, of course. There's always a reason, like some strange historical reason why it ends up at that price or whatever. And maybe it's not the current management that was responsible for issuing all those shares and targeting a price that low and whatever. But uh, you just know when you're looking through those things that you're going to look through a lot of garbage to find the the few things that might be worth it. But the the advantage to that is that other people feel the same way and might not put in the time to look through it. So that's how you're going to find a few things that people don't know about. Um, I mean, I mentioned computer services. I think if that was in an index or something, it would never have been that cheap. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's just being unlisted that that's how people – because it would have – for instance, I'm sure it would have been on some dividend achiever list or something if it had been in an index, mm -hmm. you know? A hundred percent. You know, it's it's funny for me because like I, I, 
what's so interesting about your your thesis and your thought process is that you know you got you really focus on getting as much information as you can from financial statements and what's out there but yet you're also looking on the OTC for these types of companies most people will hear that and they'll be like dude are you what's i don't get it you know and yet you here you are you're doing it you're making a business out of it you know what do you mm-hmm. say to those people that are like i, I don't understand well, we so the thing is, we look at what are, I mean, as a group, some of the worst businesses that are out <laughs> sure, there, some yeah. of the worst public co- companies and the the worst stocks, um, and then we have to find those few that are that are good. But that's true, even um, even more specifically, like for instance, I mentioned Naco. I mean, it, the fact that it's a coal company, I think that's why people aren't that interested in it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very clear right away that it's a coal company. You have to read a lot more to learn about their business model and other things about it. Um, and that tends to be the advantages that we find, whether it's over the counter or different countries. I mean, we've invested in some stocks that are pretty um, – well, in some cases, they're, they're businesses that would be somewhat well-known in the U.S., but they're not listed here. They list somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, if they do that, they often will be cheaper than if they list in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, and like we're looking for things like that where it's, it's extra work to find them. It's a lot extra work. Um, and you have to look through incredible numbers of stocks to find the few cases that are like that. But there's a there's a very good chance that a lot of people will screen and say pick a country that they screen in. And so they won't screen in all the other countries that a stock from the U.S. could be listed in. Mm-hmm. Or they'll screen and they'll say we'll take out the OTC stocks. Or even if they t- leave the OTC stocks in, OTC stocks in, they may screen to say don't show me anything under a dollar. Or don't show me, you know, that's a very common one. And I understand why people would do that because otherwise you spend your whole day looking at, at scams and things. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you have to look at them and then quickly eliminate them to find the few things that that um, are attractive that way. I mean, th- the best businesses around are giant companies that are in the indexes. But everyone knows that and they trade at prices that reflect that generally. Um, so that, that's why we don't own them. It's not that I don't like Facebook and Microsoft and whatever. It's that they, they don't offer them at prices that I like. Got it. So again, I'm doing another uh, quick transition here because uh, I just saw that uh, you and your partner, uh, Andrew Kuhn, just announced last week uh, that you have this new partnership with Willow Oak Asset mm-hmm. Management. Uh, can you elaborate on this exciting new venture? Yeah, sure. So uh, we've done managed accounts, separately managed accounts for about a year and a half now, uh, something like that. And um, this with Willow Oak is um, a fund. So it'll launch in uh, January of next year. Nice. It'll be a fund. Uh, Willow Oak, for people who don't know, is uh, a company that does fund management services. So it does things um, that help us set up a fund and um, also that help with certain things about running a fund that are different from running managed accounts, which we can do on our, uh, our own. Um, and it actually is a, a part of a public company, I should say. It's The public company is Enterprise Diversified, which was formerly SiteStar. Um, I don't own any stock in the company. I'm not going to ever own any stock in that company, but um, but it does trade, and that it uh, um, that's how I was familiar with it. So I had followed it because it was a microcap stock for a while, and I saw they were starting to transition from their legacy business that they had into uh, fund management stuff, and I especially saw that they had partnered with someone, um, Dave Waters, who runs Alluvial. Sure. And um, I had read for. I don't know when he started his blog, maybe 2012, something like that. Probably started OTC Adventures. Mm-hmm. So I've read that blog religiously the same way I would re- read like uh, Nate's blog, Ob All Stocks, you know. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I'd seen they partner with them. So I said to Andrew, you know, you should talk to them because I think they're really um, trying to change into being Willow Oak, this company basically, to be working with funds like what we do, uh, like what Alluvial does. And uh, I see that they're already partnered with someone who's doing some stuff that's very similar to what we do. And uh, so we talked to them. And they were interested in uh, in having us set up a fund. They own part of the management company, and in exchange, they provide uh, the services that we would need. And they've done this a few times with different um, funds, so they also just are able to help us in finding what kind of providers we need for different things. And there are all sorts of boring things that you don't want to know about about um, <laughs> the uh, sorts of things that you need just for reporting things, for uh, vetting uh, to make sure that certain people are qualified and things like that, and all sorts of things with a fund which are different from managed accounts. Managed accounts are simple because um, the client just has it with the broker, and then we just manage the account for them, but the client can just click something basically to get rid of us, uh, and then they still have the account in their name the whole time. A fund is putting that all together in one place, and it's very different legally and stuff. Well, congrats, man. I mean, this is big news. 
Yeah, very big. Yeah. And it was fun going there to New York for uh, the weekend meeting with all the people. Cool. There we met a lot of people who are very focused on like illiquid stocks and things like that. Uh, they like investing in funds like those funds and and all that stuff because that was their investor day for all their funds was at that event. And so we got to be there with that and meet a lot of people who focus on the same sort of things we do. So it was a lot of fun that way just in terms of learning about a bunch of stocks that I didn't know about um, that some people were able to find in different countries and things. And, you know, they did presentations on all those funds and – I don't think anyone mentioned a fund that the average person – anyone mentioned a holding that the average person had ever heard of. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think there is any stock mentioned by any of those funds that, that people would know about as like being in the S&P 500 or something. So uh, it was just a lot of fun to have everyone in one place that usually you know, you're very on your own focusing on these kinds of stocks. You know, there's no one else to talk to about them. Cool. So I, what, what investing experience would you say helped guide your current thesis or, or – or- or maybe investing experience that you learn the most from. Um, that you know, I think that 2008 and 2009 were probably the most important experiences that I had. Uh, with also the end of 1999 through like 2002 or something. So those two really, um, because of. Um, uh, be, well, let's say 2008, 2009. So 2008 um, was what people know it was. And mostly everything went down. And, and I don't know that there was a lot to learn from that other than s- avoiding certain kinds of things, which might seem safe, but that people knew were, were risky in terms of what they were doing uh, um, with debt levels and things, but they just felt it could go on. You know, it, it would continue for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but 2009 was very interesting because it really uh, was the first time that I had remembered where you could buy really high quality companies, big, really high quality companies that everyone knew about at really low prices. Mm -hmm. And so it really did reinforce for me the importance of like concentrating and also the importance of um, uh, being willing to buy these things when they're sort of out of favor and stuff like that. I was talking about that um, recently with someone where um, I talked about, as an example, I uh, I bought um, in probably early 2010, 10, it might have been for this stock instead of 2009. I bought FICO. I do not own it anymore. Uh, and so that's uh, Fair Isaac. FICO is, does the FICO score. But that's a really good example because I think it was trading about 10 times free cash flow. And it was using most of its free cash flow to buy back its own stock. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's pretty much a – it's close to a monopoly. There is a competing credit score created by FICO's biggest customers called Vantage Score. And they created it just because they didn't like that FICO had a monopoly on credit scores. Um, I don't think it's – I mean still has – 10 years later hasn't been widely adopted. But it creates some competition for them. Um, and it's just – you know, if I were to say to you, you know uh, – you know, what is a credit score, whatever you say, oh, a FICO score. I mean, it is like Kleenex to tissue or something, you know, that way. Mm-hmm. And um, and yet it was available at this incredibly cheap price and you could buy it there. Um, and it's an interesting experience because I sold it too soon. It went up, but I sold it uh, very quickly thereafter, a year or two later or something. I, I don't remember exactly, but for a very high annualized uh, return. But it would go on probably, I think, that stock to return like 30% a year for the next 10 years or something to the point where I haven't looked recently at what it's at, but it probably went from 10 times free cash flow to at some point like 40 times free cash flow. Mm. And it is not today at a lower point in the cycle. It's probably at a higher point in the cycle than it was in 2010 or 2009 You know, when it was probably the least amount of credit scores done there. So investors were willing – to pay four times more for the same company for each dollar it was earning uh, just because they were very sure of it now and they were very unsure what the future would be back then. But nothing about the company or anything was very unsure. It was just at that moment they didn't know when it would turn, you know. But eventually credit would come back. We just didn't know when it would be or something like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, that kind of experience for countless stocks coming out in 2009, 2010, buying them, um, you know, those are the best years in terms of my returns and stuff were 2009, 2010, 2011, um, because there was just so many things like that available. And there's no catalyst. No one has any idea when it'll change. But the swing in the market's attitude towards them is so extreme that you will find that sometimes the same dollar of earnings is going to be valued four times more later. And you just have to buy a really good company at a time when people don't want to own it. And eventually their mood will change that dramatically. And it, it I mean, I use that as the example because it's sort of 
I think the name that would people would um, most uh, know, FICO. Mm-hmm. But there were lots of stocks like that that were similar, 10 times free cash flow or something, and practically monopolies. Mm-hmm. And uh, the fact that people weren't that positive on them. I mean, an example of a stock I never owned, Microsoft. Uh, it probably had something less extreme than FICO, but a pretty big change over you know five years or something in terms of people's attitudes towards it. Um, when it's had a pretty similar market position, both at the beginning and end. Uh, so there's just certain times where people are very um, pessimistic about a company, but especially they just have no idea. They don't see anything on the horizon for how uh, something will change. And so they put a really low multiple on it. But if you know that it's going to be durable, that 10 years from now its earnings will be higher than they are today, mm-hmm. then you can buy it and just wait. And eventually people will bid it up to a really crazy price because – we're always buying things at 10 times earnings or something where people will say, well, what do you expect that it'll get to 15 times and you sell out or something? And what's amazing is it happens not infrequently at, at all that you buy a good business at 10 times and one day it'll trade at 30 times or something. And so that's really the experience I think that taught me the most is seeing how cheap quality companies got uh, right after the bust and how expensive they've gotten now in the uh, boom that followed. Very cool. So Jeff, as I'm, we're rounding the bend here, you know, my well, I have two more questions, but mm-hmm. this one, you know, what, what advice do you have for new investors that are looking at the stock market? Um, that's hard. the The best advice I can give, if you're going to pick stocks, the best advice is not to think about the stock market, to think about it as just a market for stocks that you could buy, um, and then to focus on your own returns and not compare yourself to the market, because. Um, the, the thing that people have been sort of taught to do is you have to compare yourself to the market every year and, and over any period of time. And if you're not at beating the market, then you're not adding value and all those sorts of things. But I talked a little bit about how I started in like the end of the 1990s I've been investing through now. The truth is that my returns have not changed that much throughout that entire period. They've been remarkably similar. <laughs> and yet there's a 10-year period in there where I think the market did like 5% a year. There's a 10-year period where it did like 15% a year. And so if you compare yourself to the market as if you're that's what you're doing, then you'll be think you're a genius, you know, in the 2000 in the uh, early 2000s and you'll think you're an idiot in the uh, later 2010s. Uh, when right. really it's just that you're doing the same thing. You're, you're buying the same quality companies at the same prices. You're, you're putting in the same amount of effort and you're getting often a fairly similar absolute return. But you're just comparing yourself to, to the market and you're, you're obsessing about that benchmark. So I would really tell people that, look, your, like your goals for your life in terms of how you want to live and what you want to retire with and the safety that you want to feel that you have from things that are – um, save that you don't, you know, need an income this month to be able to get through and all that are the things that you want from your investments. That's why you're really doing it. And all that requires is that you compound at a certain acceptable rate. And if you sit down and look at it, you'll often see, oh, well, if I did 10% a year for my whole career, that'd be fine. That's what I need. As long as I save enough or whatever, you know, that could achieve a lot of my goals. If I did 15% a year, that would achieve my goals. And it doesn't matter what the S&P will do to achieve those things. So, you know, if you think about it that way, that would be my biggest advice because people – I can't tell you how many people talk about – I've talked to many people who have beaten the market recently. And yet they're depressed that someone else that they're reading about, some fund, has done, you know, 30 percent a year when they've done 20 percent a year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's what will happen. Uh, and, and there'll always be someone doing even better that way, you know? Right. Um, and especially for people who are putting in so much work, finding more on discovered things and whatever, they're putting in all this work and stuff, and they see that someone else that they know is just in a 100% in S&P 500 index fund or whatever, and they're up by like the same amount in some years. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I would say that easily, even when I've beaten the market over a period of time, one out of three years, I've been behind the market in those periods where I beat it. It's still that much, you know, and so you'll be depressed at one out of every three years while you're doing great. In the times when you're doing great, you'll be depressed one out of three times if you think that way, you know. So the real moral of the story is just be happy when you don't lose money. Yeah, I mean, be happy when you're doing. <laughs> be, be happy when you're doing what you um, set out to do and are accomplishing it, sure. regardless of what other people are doing and what that, how the market's doing. Right. You know, if you lose money, then obviously your approach is not uh, working. <laughs> and uh, and if you have low returns for a long period of time, then it's not working too. If, if you find that you're doing 5% a year for 10 years, that's something to worry about. Mm-hmm. But if you find that you're doing 15% a year and the market also did 15% a year, that's not something to get real worked up about. Right. You know, 
Um, yeah. the, the thing is to avoid losses, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And also to avoid periods where you have just unacceptably low returns, like bond-like returns. Mm -hmm. But as long as you're getting equity-type returns over any time you can look five or ten years, let's say. I wouldn't look shorter than five years. And as long as you're getting you know, the kinds of returns that academics would say is what you get in equities over time. Um, then you shouldn't be too worried about that, about, you know, that you're behind something else because there'll be periods where you're ahead of it. And the big thing is you, what will eventually happen is you'll start taking risks that you shouldn't take, uh, in the later periods of these markets and things, uh, when you start to think that you have to do as well as the market instead of settling for, for less, because all the value investors who did well in the early two thousands trailed the market in the late 1990s. Um, you know, they did not keep up with what was happening in the last years of the 1990s. And that's it. The fact that they didn't invest in those things is what allowed them to do well in the early 2000s, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would really say to people, if you're an individual investor, the big advantage you have over institutions is you get to focus on absolute returns and don't have to worry about relative returns because that's the curse of institutional investors. They are just thinking in terms of relative returns. For sure. So, Jeff, with that, where can my audience go and find more information about focus compounding, both the podcast, capital management? Uh, where, where should they all go? Okay, so um, Focus Compounding Podcast, uh, they can find it in any podcast app. Uh, FocusCompounding.com is the website, and my uh, partner, Andrew Kuhn, puts everything up on a Twitter that is at Focus Compound, no ING. I guess Twitter doesn't allow you enough characters or something. Yeah, we went to two, 280 or whatever it was. They can't put three, <laughs> yeah. three more letters. <laughs> Anyways, Jeff, dude, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me today. And, uh, you know, I look forward to the next time we chat. Yep, absolutely. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast. And thank you, Jeff, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast. Go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast or on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast. We'll have our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of StockNewsNow.com, the official microcap news source, and the Microcap Review Magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap Podcast. Have a great week, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving.